Hi everyone, this is Adam Wolfberg from Avia Health. We're gonna get started with the webinar in just a couple of minutes. We'll give it a couple more minutes for people to get into the webinar room. Welcome everybody, this is Adam Wolfberg from Ovia Health, and welcome to the webinar that Ovia is uh, very pleased to be co-hosting with the Preeclampsia Foundation. The title of the webinar is What Every Mom Needs to Know About Preeclampsia. So by way of our agenda today, uh, I'm gonna give you a very brief introduction to Ovia and the Preeclampsia Foundation. Um, I'm going to uh, introduce you to uh, our um, terrific speakers, uh, and then you'll hear uh, Ushma Patel tell her story uh, of her experience with preeclampsia, and then um, we'll hear from um, Dr. Doug Wolkers about uh, the disease itself, um, and then finally, we'll have plenty of time to answer your questions. Uh, if you have questions, um, please type them into the question bar um, that's part of the webinar functionality, uh, and we'll keep track of those questions and answer them uh, at the end. Uh, the webinar uh, will then be posted uh, on the OVIA website and on the Preeclampsia Foundation website uh, if you uh, want to watch it again or if you want to uh, send the link to your friends. So by way of, um, of uh, background on the uh, sponsoring organizations today, uh, Ovia Health uh, is a women's health technology company that helps women and families navigate their most important moments uh, with personalized, data-driven solutions for pregnancy, um, fertility, and um, parenting. The Preeclampsia Foundation uh, is the most important organization focused specifically on preeclampsia, uh, HELP syndrome, and other hypertensive disorders of pregnancy. Um, the Preeclampsia Foundation focuses on patient support and education, uh, advocacy and raising awareness, uh, does um, research as well, uh, and also supports a registry of cases that we'll mention at the end of the presentation. And the foundation is always interested in uh, adding to this registry. So if you or a loved one or a friend has experience with preeclampsia, uh, please consider um, signing up for the registry. Uh, we have uh, two terrific speakers joining us today. Uh, Ushma Patel um, developed severe preeclampsia and uh, partial HELP syndrome um, in January of 2014 at 36 weeks. Uh, professionally, Ushma has a background in public health and health policy, and she's currently the Director for Special Projects and Educational Programs at the Institute for Patient and Family-Centered Care, a nonprofit based in Maryland that advances the understanding and practice of patient and family-centered uh, care. Uh, given her career and personal experiences, she's developed a strong interest in representing the patient voice and raising awareness for preeclampsia. She's served on the advisory council for the Preeclampsia Foundation since November of 2014, and she lives in North Carolina uh, with her husband and two children. Dr. Doug Wolkers is an associate clinical professor in the Division of Perinatal Medicine at the University of California, 
California, San Diego, and sees high-risk women at several hospitals and clinics in that area. Uh, he is the 2012 to 2014 president of the North American Society for the Study of Hypertension and Pregnancy. Uh, Dr. Wolker has graduated from Stanford University uh, and serving his internship and residency at the University of California, San Diego, and did his fellowship at McGee Women's Hospital uh, in um, Pittsburgh. He's a board certified specialist in maternal fetal medicine. Uh, like I said, my name is Adam Wolfberg. Uh, I'm also a maternal fetal medicine specialist and I serve as the chief medical officer uh, here at uh, Ovia Health. So uh, what I'm gonna do now is uh, turn it over to Ushma. Uh, Ushma, um, we're really grateful to have you um, with us today and I'm delighted that you uh, have been um, kind enough to, to tell us about your experience uh, with this disease. So with that, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Adam, and thank you so much, um, everyone, for having me here today. Uh, my story begins in June of 2013. Um, my husband and I, we um, started to try to get pregnant, and we, you know, it happened immediately. We were very excited. Um, I was 28 years old and in great shape. Um, I exercised quite a bit and, um, you know, really just very excited um, for our first pregnancy. Next slide, please. My pregnancy was pretty typical. I had um, some symptoms like morning sickness, um, some bad acne and headaches, um, but we thought, you know, everything was normal. Um, we got to travel a bit and we really tried to enjoy, you know, the precious time that we had, just the two of us. Um, my anatomy scan also looked great. Um, we were expecting a baby girl, um, so we were both very, very excited. I did have some pubic pain that started in the second trimester, which was a little bit uncomfortable. Um, and then some swelling began at 35 weeks. And again, we thought all of this was completely normal. Next slide. Um, these are, you know, some pictures of the swelling at its worst. Uh, my ankles were really swollen. I could barely fit into my shoes. Um, and you can see there um, my face. It really looked like someone had punched me. Uh, my eyelids were very, very swollen. But again, we just thought that this was part of the normal pregnancy as we approached my due date. So around late 35 weeks, you know, around the 35, 36 week mark, um, I actually saw a um, post on my Facebook friend's page about HELP syndrome and preeclampsia. And, you know, I thought to myself, man, these, these symptoms really sound like mine. So, you know, that really kind of um, alarmed us. And we were out running errands and I decided, you know, let me go to the local pharmacy and check my blood pressure. So we went there, got it checked out. And it was, it was pretty high. And I called my doctor right away. And of course, he said, um, you know, to come in, that they'll just check everything out. I'm sure everything is fine. Um, so we went to the hospital, um, didn't have a bag packed or anything, literally just, you know, took our phone and our wallet and, and went to the hospital. Um, you know, he kind of mentioned a little bit of preeclampsia that it could be this. Um, checked my um the urine um the protein in my urine and you know decided um let's just keep you overnight for monitoring and see um, how the night progresses the next morning um platelets had dropped some more there was definitely some protein in my urine and the doctor recommended um, induction um, he noted that if the platelets continue to drop it'd be really difficult to get an epidural um, or really any type of pain medication. So we thought the, safe, the safest route would probably be to do um, delivery via C-section. Next slide, please. Um, so on January 30th at 12.20 p.m., uh, my baby girl made her debut. Um, her name is Asha and we were really excited the delivery went well and um, everything um, seemed pretty normal. Uh, they did notice a heart murmur in Asha, but 
you know, figured that it was probably innocent. A lot of people kind of go their whole life with it. Um, so, you know, things are fine. Uh, next slide, please. After the delivery, um, I was on magnesium sulfate for 24 hours and honestly, pretty, pretty out of it. Um, things were really blurry. Um, I was, you know, confined to the bed. Uh, you know, don't even really remember getting to hold her um, a whole lot. Um, struggled with nursing um, and breastfeeding her and really just didn't get much rest. There were a lot of providers coming in and out of the, the room um, and my blood pressure remained high. Um, so they were definitely, you know, going to keep us there until my blood pressure could stabilize. Next slide. So at around day five, like I said, they had kept me there because of my blood pressure. And then also Asha, you know, had some high bilirubin levels. So we were still there. And I had, you know, was finally walking around um, and able to change diapers. So that night I gave, you know, my husband needed some rest after um, the five day um, journey so far. And so I was up all night taking care of Asha, who was sitting up and uh, pretty fuzzy fussy and I felt really weird honestly I wasn't able to understand things I felt really on edge and um, at one point I remember feeling so bad that I had to plead to the nurse like please come in and check on me I something something feels wrong um, I was given blood pressure medication and within one hour I really felt like my blood and my veins uh, were on fire and I really can only describe it as having an out-of-body experience. I mean, just something happened. And when they finally realized that, okay, you know, this woman, something is going on with her, they took me down um, to get a CT scan, and they realized I had suffered from a subarachnoid brain hemorrhage, uh, which is a type of stroke. So at the same time, Asha, her temperature and oxygen had dropped. So she was taken to the special care nursery and I was taken to the ICU. And unfortunately, uh, my case was too complex and they were just you know, throwing out terms such as a possible aneurysm and that I would need immediate brain surgery. So I was transferred to another hospital to the neurosciences ICU. Next slide. So I stayed in the neurosciences ICU for a couple nights. I had a lot of tests done. Um, I had some episodes of delirium and mental confusion. I was acting like a, a completely different person um, because of the stroke. Um, I did continue to pump um, in the ICU and my husband would drive the milk to the other hospital and you know, to see Asha. And we would see each other um, through FaceTime, which you can see there on the, on the slide. And that was really our only way of um, communicating for the next couple of days. Next slide. So I finally discharged after three days, um, you know, had really, really bad headaches. Um, it really felt like the worst headache of my life. But, you know, they put me on medication to regulate my blood pressure and, you know, said that, you know, after several weeks that, um, I would kind of return to normal. Um, so the first thing we did, we went straight to the hospital to go see Asha, which is that picture there of us finally reunited after a couple of days. Um, and a couple of days later after that, she was finally discharged. Um, but unfortunately, the struggle did not end there. Next slide. For me, um, you know, it took several weeks, if not months, to really return to normal. Um, I had a little bit of post-traumatic stress disorder from you know, the entire experience. Definitely had some postpartum depression and anxiety. You know, this is not what I expected a first um, pregnancy and delivery to look like. It's just something that I never even heard of and did not expect to happen. Uh, breastfeeding was really hard. And just long term, I, I worried about my, my heart health, my neurological health. And, you know, at that point, we were, we were both were like, we are so done having another kid. Um, and for Asha, my baby girl, um, she struggled to gain weight. Um, and we were in and out of the doctor's office quite a bit. Um, so, it, you know, it was, it was a really tough time. 
Next slide. Um, so in terms of where we are now, um, that innocent heart murmur that Asha had, it ended up actually being a, a congenital heart defect. So she had to have open heart surgery at eight months. She had pulmonary stenosis. And then her eyelids were also very droopy, which we, we noticed from the beginning and kept raising to the doctor that, you know, something doesn't seem right. So she had um, ptosis, which resulted in also another open uh, surgery, an eye surgery. And um, we, we got genetic testing done. And in February 2016, um, they finally figured out, you know, how the whole, all these conditions kind of tied together and she was confirmed to have Noonan syndrome. Next slide, please. Well, at the same time, um, I actually got pregnant again, which was completely not planned. But fortunately, this time around, uh, we knew what to look for. I was followed very, very closely by a maternal fetal medicine doctor. They monitored my urine, my blood pressure. Um, we got a doula, and I'm so happy to report that I was able to have an unmedicated vaginal birth um, after what we went through with Asha. I did have some slight tearing, um, which resulted in an OR, you know, repair in the um, operating room. And I did have to have a blood transfusion, but honestly, um, my son, Avi, was healthy and, um, you know, everything went much better than the first time around. Next slide. Um, so here are some pictures of them today. So on the left, you can see the day that Asha met him. Um, and now um, that the second picture is um, of both of them in March and um, they're the best of friends. They're both, you know, healthy. Even Asha, her condition has kind of stabilized and, um, you know, there is hope. She's almost five. He's almost two. Um, so, you know, we're, we were able to, you know, have a healthy and happy family. Um, but I do want to kind of, share my story with others and make sure that pregnant women are aware of the things to look out for. Uh, next slide. So just realizing that preeclampsia can happen to anyone. Um, for me, it came out of the blue, didn't expect it, it was completely healthy. Um, things like trusting your instinct. Um, you know your body best. The doctor is definitely the expert and should take good care of you, but you know, you know, when something is wrong. Um, reaching out for help if you don't have someone um, to kind of advocate for you, definitely um, try to have that person, either your mom or sister, a spouse, a friend. Um, speaking up and asking questions, there's no dumb question, and it's always good to kind of voice your opinion if you feel like something is wrong. So thank you so much for allowing me to share my story. Ushma, thank you very much for sharing your story. Um, really uh, difficult experience, but so glad to see uh, that ultimately um, it worked out as well as it did. But thank you so much for sharing. We're going to turn now to uh, Dr. Doug Wolkers, who's going to talk us through uh, some of the information um, from a physician's perspective so that uh, those who are listening uh, who either have experience with preeclampsia or concerned about the disease, know what to look for, uh, know how to potentially prevent it, and understand how it's treated. So, Dr. Wilkers? All right. Thank you, Adam. And um, uh, greetings to everybody on the line. Uh, to uh, Ushma, that was an incredible story, and I, I, too, am very glad that you've come through with a healthy second pregnancy. Uh, it seems like the theme from your talk was surprise and kind of unexpectedness of the whole ordeal. And that's what preeclampsia's history has been through centuries of medicine. Uh, not a lot of understanding of it and certainly uh, not a lot of anticipation of its complications when it arises. But um, my main message is that it's, it's still not that common and most pregnancies will do well. It's just that we have to arm ourselves with knowledge. So the first slide here is just a classification of the different kinds of hypertension in pregnancy. It's been many years in coming, but the American College of OBGYN in 2013 kind of codified these four uh, hypertensive disorders, preeclampsia and eclampsia, which is characterized by a nuanced set of hypertension 
plus some other finding like protein in the urine or some severe features, headaches, for example, or abnormal laboratory findings. Uh, superimposed preeclampsia is a, is a second condition, and that arises in women who already have chronic hypertension, as you can see from the checkbox there, who then also develop some additional feature. Uh, gestational hypertension, which is just new onset hypertension of pregnancy, usually transient and goes away after delivery. And then women who have chronic hypertension, where the hypertension just persists through pregnancy but doesn't worsen. And the different criteria for the blood pressure or other findings are listed uh, in the last line. And in the next slide, if you advance that for me, Adam, you'll see these are the features for severe preeclampsia. And maybe many of the listeners today have had severe preeclampsia and recognize some of these uh, conditions, such as a very high blood pressure above 160 over 110, uh, progressive kidney or what we call renal insufficiency, which can be detected by laboratory findings or decreased urine output, uh, impaired liver function, that might be something that, uh, that uh, Ushma had, and this is when the liver is inflamed and the laboratory test can detect that. Thrombocytopenia, which is a low platelet count, and platelet are those small uh, structures uh, like small little parts of blood cells that help to clot blood and prevent hemorrhage, and if the platelet count falls less than 100,000, that's a marker of severe disease. And neurologic disturbances, also something Ushma relayed. Uh, these can include headaches, of course, uh, neurologic changes like headaches, uh, excuse me, like visual changes, um, seizures um, can also de uh, develop. And then uh, finally, one of the last severe features is pulmonary or respiratory complications, including fluid in the lungs or decreased oxygenation. Now, there are also several preeclampsia variants. These are not as well defined. Um, Ushma uh, may have described that she had a condition called HELP syndrome, which stands for hemolysis, which is breaking up of blood cells, elevated liver function test, and low platelets. When these three conditions are found together, we call it HELP syndrome. But there are also cases of a very unique postpartum or delayed preeclampsia up to four weeks after delivery. Uh, there is a condition called mirror syndrome in which the mother develops ascites and edema at a profound level, even in the absence of, of hypertension in some cases. And this too is thought to be a variant of preeclampsia. Next slide. Now this, uh, this graph shows the epidemiology of preeclampsia. It's kind of busy, but what it demonstrates is that the rate of preeclampsia uh, per 1,000 uh, deliveries. And if you can see maybe the average level here, it's around 40 to 50 per 1,000 deliveries. So that's 5%. So the rate across the country, about 5% overall. There are certainly uh, differences amongst ethnic and racial groups. African Americans um, have had uh, historically very high rates of preeclampsia, of almost twofold the rates of the background population. And we've known that for years and still haven't figured out exactly why. Um, uh, within each, each uh, racial or ethnic group, um, you can see that there is a different categorization for the uh, type of preeclampsia. Most preeclampsia really is of the non-severe or mild type, as the dark blue boxes show, uh, but there has been an increasing amount of severe preeclampsia, that is preeclampsia with those features as we've mentioned. Uh, eclampsia, which is the seizure, is a very small uh, percentage, only 1% one or one percent or so of all preeclampsia results in eclampsia. Um, next slide. Uh, this graph, which is condensed over uh, many years from 1980 to 2010, and which uses a log scale to kind of help accentuate um, trends, shows that the rate of preeclampsia of any preeclampsia overall has slightly increased when we're using the best data we have. So there appears to be some increase overall in preeclampsia. And most of that increase is likely due to this dotted green line, the increasing rate of severe preeclampsia. And why this occurs, uh, we're not exactly sure, although next slide, I think we'll. We'll uh, list some of the causes for this trend. It might be, uh, in, nope, not not yet, Adam. I'll go backwards. Hang on. There we go. So up in the box here, just to list that there's increasing rates of maternal obesity, which uh, correlates to hypertension. There's actually a decrease in smoking, and if anybody wants to ask, but there actually is a, a, a lowering of the rate of preeclampsia in women who smoke, although they do not have healthier pregnancies by any means. There's also an, an aging of the population carrying pregnancies, and that's another risk factor for preeclampsia that might be accounting for the trend. Next slide. Uh, this graph attempts to kind of show us all uh, where preeclampsia happens overall. So if you look at 
We'll start with the orange, uh, the lighter orange boxes here, the pumpkin orange. As a percentage of all births, um, where does preeclampsia occur? So most preeclampsia is happening at term in women who are 37 to 40 weeks or so of gestation. So that's where the majority of uh, cases of preeclampsia occur. It's pretty rare when you get down to these early gestational ages, you know, just a percent or so of, uh, in each gestational week block uh, would account for, uh, is, is part of the, the total occurrence of preeclampsia. But the darker orange is showing you that of deliveries at each week, which percentage of those uh, pregnancies have preeclampsia? And it's, it's interesting and informative to look at this rise, little hump here, between 26 to 34 weeks or so, uh, that, that shows that many of these deliveries, you know, up to 15% are complicated by preeclampsia. And that's because preeclampsia is one of the main reasons we have to deliver this early uh, in pregnancy. Um, majority of preeclampsia, as I said, is still happening at term. This slide shows some of the clinical impact, and this is something that that even physicians sometimes forget to put into context, but preeclampsia really is the number one cause of physician-indicated preterm delivery. It's almost a half of all times that we have to deliver is because of preeclampsia. It's the number one indication for labor induction, at, um, at least medical indication. A quarter of all uh, inductions are due to preeclampsia. It's, it ranks between number one, two, and three as a, a number one, as a cause of maternal mortality in different states and different countries in the world. This data, I think, is from about 2010. Uh, but this is this is a significant cause for maternal death in this country due to complications. Um, and Ushma, you know, I have to say, had a type that was very severe, and that's something that we would be exceedingly worried about when a patient presents with such advanced disease. And preeclampsia is the number three indication for any admission during pregnancy. So it's often disrupting pregnancies, requiring women to be hospitalized for monitoring, for bed rest, for blood pressure control. And it accounts for up to one-fifth of all admissions to the NICU. And the cost of this, next slide, is pretty significant, estimated um, conservatively at, at more than $2 billion. Next slide. All right, so some things that I know the audience is very interested in is, well, how do you prevent preeclampsia? And unfortunately, uh, things uh, that we'd like to, to believe would help, such as you know, starting an exercise program or changing our diet, uh, don't have a huge impact. You know, of course, as I mentioned before, uh, overweight um, or having chronic hypertension can be risk factors. But um, once a patient is pregnant, there's not a lot that we can start that will reduce that chance of preeclampsia. Low-dose aspirin has the most data to support its efficacy. And in, in women who have a, a low risk of preeclampsia, healthy women, maybe uh, women who've had previous pregnancy without preeclampsia, there's about a 10% risk reduction uh, taking low-dose aspirin. But the effect is better in, in women who have higher risk uh, indications. The doses between 80 and new data up to 150 milligrams per day uh, started after the first trimester and continued into the third trimester of pregnancy. This low dose of aspirin does not cross the placenta and has not been shown in any studies to harm the fetus, but it does help to make the mother's blood vessels and platelets healthier to reduce preeclampsia. These are some risk factor indications in the table here. Uh, a woman who has any single major main risk factor that are listed here, such as previous preeclampsia, multifetal pregnancy, type 1 or 2 diabetes, chronic hypertension, chronic kidney disease, or autoimmune diseases, these women qualify for starting low-dose aspirin, as mentioned before, at the end of the first trimester. And for women with, with combinations of these other risk factors, such as nulliparity, that's your first pregnancy, being overweight, having a family history of preeclampsia and first-degree relatives, any combination of two of these, or as I mentioned, any single factor from the previous uh, column would qualify for taking low-dose aspirin. Although uh, research has looked at many other uh, treatments to prevent the disease, uh, vitamin C or E or other antioxidant treatments have not been shown to prevent preeclampsia, neither has salt restriction or protein diets. Antihypertensive therapy is important because it prevents severe hypertension, but it doesn't prevent the onset of preeclampsia. And bed rest also does not stop preeclampsia, although it may help to keep blood pressures lower once the disease is arising. Next, next slide, please. So what do we do with preeclampsia once we've discovered it's, it's uh, affecting our patient? Well, if the disease is, is diagnosed, uh, we want to prevent eclampsia or seizures, and that's what that magnesium sulfate infusion, IV infusion, is given for about 24 hours, but it can be extended. It can be restarted if neurologic symptoms occur. This is magnesium does not stop preeclampsia. It does not treat hypertension. It's simply to prevent eclamptic seizure in this case. 
we need to treat the severe hypertension with intravenous medicines, and we can use um, uh, labetalol or hydralazine, but there are also some uh, pills, oral nifedipine and other agents that can be given to, to keep the blood pressure in a safe range to prevent stroke and headaches and other uh, complications. We try to prevent pulmonary edema or fluid buildup. Uh, that's why the doctors keep the patients dry during their labor and don't allow a lot of fluid intake. And we give steroids if the baby is still less than 37 weeks to accelerate their maturity and readiness for delivery. Unfortunately, there is no quote-unquote cure for the disease. We can't get the disease to go away during a pregnancy. And the only real way to stop the process is delivery, although, as I mentioned, preeclampsia can arise up to four weeks post-delivery. Another important element that is stressed in the American College New Guidelines is to have our patients follow up closely after delivery within three to 14 days to recheck blood pressure and to make sure that the disease is resolving and the patients don't have any questions or, or unaccounted for symptoms. Next slide. In terms of uh, managing and delivery, uh, the algorithms are pretty straightforward. If preeclampsia or gestational hypertension is diagnosed at term and the baby is mature, we recommend delivery with seizure prophylaxis. If the disease is not severe but is still preterm, these women can be hospitalized and monitored to see if they develop severe features, although this must be undertaken with a very high degree of observation to look for advancing disease. You can't uh, do this lightly or at home. At least in my opinion, most of these patients should be under direct observation. If severe preeclampsia is diagnosed and the patient is already after 34 weeks, then regardless of that prematurity, we recommend delivery uh, to prevent complications from the disease. For women who have severe preeclampsia less than 34 weeks, these are another uh, category of, where hospitalization is required to uh, monitor the patient carefully and, and see if we can delay delivery while the disease is still stable. And unfortunately, if severe preeclampsia or HELP syndrome is diagnosed very early in that pre-viable range, really be before 23 or 24 weeks, we have to counsel the patient that the outcomes are so severe that maybe uh, just delivery is best for the mother in this case. Next slide. Oh, that's it. So at this time, we turn it back over to Adam. If you have any questions, please feel free to type them in. Thanks so much, uh, Ushma and uh, Dr. Wilkers. Um, we do have some questions, uh, and um, I'm going to just turn to the questions now. Like I said earlier, uh, if you have questions, um, please feel free to type them into the questions box, uh, and we'll do our very best over the next 10 minutes or so to answer as many as we can. So uh, first question, um, uh, and many of these are, are sort of uh, clinical questions um, related to uh, the audience member's experience, so I'm going to send most of them um, to you, Doug. But the, the first one is, does uh, exercising help, exercising during pregnancy, does that uh, help to prevent the development of preeclampsia? Now, that has been studied in small trials that where women were randomized to certain degrees of, of uh, activity. Some studies showed a very small reduction in the risk and others did not. Um, we do know that uh, being fit before the pregnancy is, uh, helps to reduce that, uh, the development of a preeclampsia. Um, so I would say it certainly doesn't hurt, probably helps, and I would encourage that, but not to pick up an exercise regimen that's excessive. Great. Very helpful. Here's another question. Um, the uh, patient writes in, um, I had what my doctor said was uh, extreme preeclampsia. She said I would have to be on a medication if I got pregnant again. If I got pregnant again, what are some of the preventive treatments and how do they affect the baby? Well, um, extreme preeclampsia is, is not a recognized term, so I'm not sure what they were referring to, but probably they meant severe. Um, the recurrence risk. Severe. Yeah, for severe. Um, the, first of all, the, the chance of getting preeclampsia in another pregnancy um, is, is ranges anywhere from about 10% up to as high as 40 or 50%. But those high recurrence risks are really in patients that have uh, baseline underlying um, diseases such as lupus and lupus nephritis and severe chronic hypertension. Uh, for most patients, even with severe preeclampsia, if they're healthy outside of pregnancy, the chance of recurrence is about 20% in a future pregnancy. Um, those pregnancies, um, we, we do not, and I do not discourage women from having a second pregnancy, although, of course, discuss your case with your doctor. 
Um, I would recommend um, uh, achieving the best possible health before pregnancy with weight loss if it's indicated, control of diabetes if that's needed, exercise as we just mentioned. As for medications, again, the only really known proven preventative is low-dose aspirin. That might be what your doctor was mentioning, taking 80 to 150 milligrams a day to, to reduce the chance of preeclampsia. And if the patient already has hypertension, we want to work hard to keep that controlled with safe hypertensive medicines like beta blockers or calcium channel blockers. Dr. Wolkers, we at Ovia routinely hear from our users uh, a modicum of concern about some of these medications, um, specifically aspirin and the antihypertensives. Can you talk a little bit about the safety? of these medications in pregnancy and whether there are any known side effects uh, that might impact the um, fetus uh, or cause birth defects or other complications for the newborn? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so regarding aspirin, um, aspirin can be a little confusing for the public because aspirin is part of the category of drugs called non-steroidal anti-inflammatories or NSAIDs. These drugs, when used at high dose, can cross the placenta. So a high dose of Motrin, high dose of Advil, or even a high dose of aspirin can have negative effects on the, on the fetus. The low-dose aspirin, as we mentioned, has not been associated with these birth defects or, or adverse fetal effects, it has been studied in huge trials and shown to be safe. So I think we can be very confident that aspirin is safe uh, in, in these prescribed low doses for pregnancy. There are many different antihypertensives on the market some of which are safe and some of which are actually quite dangerous. So make sure before you conceive that you talk with your doctor about the agents needed. But we do have a lot of experience with some of the older antihypertensive drugs. Beta blockers have been used for decades. There's a small association with decreased fetal growth, but the trade-off can be for a longer, healthier pregnancy if blood pressure is adequately controlled. The same is probably true for calcium channel blockers, but I specifically would warn patients not to take a category of drugs called ACE inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blockers, uh, given their known effect on, on um, fetal organ development. They, these are teratogenic. So avoid ACE inhibitors and the ARBs, but the mm -hmm. other ones you mentioned, the beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, mm -hmm. uh, known to be safe, and yeah. low-dose aspirin. Alpha methyl dopa. Yeah. Yes, uh, and yep. uh, low-dose aspirin, also safe. Um, that's very helpful. Uh, here's another question. Um, what can be considered the best practice or recommendation um, from someone for someone with pregnancy-induced hypertension or preeclampsia regarding the, regarding the delivery method? And the, the, the um, audience member is asking about a vaginal delivery versus a cesarean and whether the risks uh, or benefits of one mode of delivery or the other uh, has a particular impact on the um, preeclampsia or hypertensive condition. Okay, very good question. And I'm glad that you phrase it as the risks or benefits of either one because it is true that both have benefits and both have risks. And the decision really should depend on that situation um, and the discussion with the patient or doctor. There is no overriding recommendation to deliver either uh, vaginally or by cesarean section for preeclampsia. Uh, there are some factors that I always use. Um, first of all is how urgent is the delivery uh, required? Uh, how likely uh, is the vaginal delivery to occur if we induce labor? Some studies showing uh, induction earlier than 28 weeks have a low likelihood of success uh, and hence may, may be better to just pursue cesarean section in those cases. And of course, most importantly, really, is the fetal status, is if the baby um, is affected by preeclampsia, is growth restricted, and has uh, poor oxygen, oxygen delivery, then a long labor is probably not going to be tolerated. Uh, but on the other hand, I've had very um, happy, successful inductions of labor for small babies uh, closer to term, and I, I usually uh, discuss these risks and options with my patients before we decide on a delivery route. Uh, that's that's very helpful. Uh, so it sounds like uh, ultimately there's no clear-cut answer, and it's a case-by-case -case decision made between the patient and her healthcare provider. Yes, good good way to summarize. So uh, we have several questions related to the risk of recurrence, 
And maybe you could just touch on that, Dr. Wilkers, one more time. Um, all told, patients with preeclampsia, what is their risk of recurrence in a subsequent pregnancy? Well, all told, um, which includes many patients with mild disease or non-severe disease at term, the recurrence risk is about 8 to 10 percent, um, but it gets higher in patients that have more severe disease. Um, so, as I said, about 20, 25 percent for women who have severe disease and recurrence risks up to 40 to 50 percent in those with underlying renovascular disease, those who have, as I mentioned, uh, chronic kidney disease, lupus, um, other syndromes. Thank you. And one point I would make is that the guidance for um, obstetric providers in the United States regarding the use of low-dose aspirin is relatively new. And so for those of you listening, if you're concerned about whether or not you ought to be on a low-dose aspirin um, during this or, an, or a subsequent pregnancy, make sure to talk to your healthcare provider, your obstetrician or your midwife early in the pregnancy uh, and make sure that they have a chance to look up those new guidelines uh, and figure out whether you ought to be on that medication that can prevent preeclampsia. Would you agree with that, Dr. Wilkers? Yeah, oh, yes, absolutely. Um, having had preeclampsia is one of the single main risk factors. All patients who have a history of preeclampsia should be on low-dose aspirin in their subsequent pregnancy. So, uh, Ushma, question for you uh, here. Um, were the symptoms sure. that uh, Asha developed as a newborn in any way related to your preeclampsia? You know, I don't think there's a way to know that. Um, as far as we know, you know, they said that the, it was just two completely different things and that we just had bad luck, unfortunately. Well, it looks to me as though in the end you had really good luck. So I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> that is true. That is true. They are here and I'm I'm here healthy and happy. So we are, we're very blessed. But I think that is an important distinction that um, uh, that uh, there's no association between preeclampsia and fetal cardiac issues or other um, genetic syndromes. Okay, next question. Um, back to you, Dr. Wolkers. Um, how fast does preeclampsia come on? Uh, how, how fast is the onset? Um, and it, it's oh, well. a long question, but does it happen? So does it happen very quickly, or does it? Do the symptoms and signs occur over a period of days or weeks? Yeah, to answer that, I would you know ask all the listeners to think about you know what is preeclampsia. I mean, when we diagnose it and give that label to a patient, we're basing it on her meeting particular criteria of blood pressure being this high and protein being this high or having some other symptom. But that doesn't mean that the process hasn't been evolving for days or weeks beforehand. And so we can pick up a patient whose blood pressure is increasing weeks before they actually get a blood pressure high enough to meet the definition of preeclampsia. And then, of course, if you're thinking medically, there's some process taking place that, can, that is occurring underneath the radar that we can't see before uh, the symptoms finally reveal themselves. So... The, the true answer is that preeclampsia evolves slowly over time, and it is a disease that arises from factors in the placenta, so it really starts with the placenta um, having dysfunction, and that can be as early as the first trimester. But that being said, we can't make a diagnosis until um, those, those markers are available to see, and that can happen quite quickly. A patient may not have had any edema or headaches and come to the office one day, and her blood pressure can be exceedingly high, has protein in the urine, which she never would have felt or sensed, and may need to be delivered even within a day or two um, and have, have had no warning. Now, the problem is, as I said, there clearly is a preclinical stage to this disease, and we just don't have a good, convenient, safe, and, and economical way to monitor for it. So, um, yeah, so the main answer is yes, it can happen very quickly. Uh, but it but it does take weeks or months to evolve uh, from a healthy pregnancy. So we're running out of time, but I want to get in two quick questions here. Um, one question is whether the medications that we use to either prevent or treat preeclampsia, 
uh, and, and hypertensive disorders of pregnancy. And so I'm talking specifically about the antihypertensives that are safe in pregnancy and low-dose aspirin. How safe are those in terms of breastfeeding? I, I can answer that uh, that they're both safe. Um, the low-dose aspirin would not need to be continued post-delivery, so that one you probably can stop. But um, as you know, we, we give Motrin, Advil at high, high levels for pain after delivery, and they're, they're not excreted in high levels in the breast milk. So so you could you could take aspirin if needed. The antihypertensives are, are also safe, except for, um, uh, well, certain newer agents. But if you were started on a calcium channel blocker or a beta blocker, or we're taking alpha methyl dopa, those can be continued as well because of low excretion rates in the breast milk. And so the fetus, I mean, excuse me, the newborn is really essentially getting a, a trivial amount of that um, agent. It will not affect the blood pressure of the newborn. Super. And the last question is, is it possible to have chronic hypertension before and during pregnancy and not develop preeclampsia? Yes, absolutely. Um, absolutely. That's, that accounts for about 4 to 5 percent of all hypertension in pregnancy, women who have chronic hypertension and do not develop any worsening of their hypertension or uh, markers of preeclampsia. Thank you. So with that, we'll wrap up. Um, first, I want to uh, thank uh, Ushma Patel for um, offering uh, a really helpful uh, and inspirational story of her experience. Uh, and um, her um, two awesome children, uh, Dr. Wolkers, uh, for providing an overview of the disorder and answering um, so many questions from listeners. Uh, the, we'd also like to thank the Preeclampsia Foundation for co-hosting this webinar, and I do want to draw your attention to their registry. Like I said, if you or a friend or family member uh, has experience with preeclampsia, please consider adding your story so that they can advance the science of this disease. Uh, on behalf of Ovia Health, we really appreciate your joining us um, for this webinar today on preeclampsia. Uh, we hope it's been useful, and uh, we will look forward to um, meeting up with you uh, on the next webinar that we host, and we'll publicize that uh, when it's ready. So thanks again, and have a great day.